Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm Joan Polashik, the Acting Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute. It's my great privilege to introduce today's Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy program, which honors four officers for their courage in advancing the Department of State's mission following the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Since September 2020, the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative has shared stories of historical and modern day heroes who have displayed policy, moral, or physical courage while advancing the State Department's mission. These stories shed light on the unsung contributions made by past and present members of the Department of State's Foreign Service, Civil Service, and locally employed staff. It's fitting that today's event is taking place on May 7th, designated as Foreign Affairs Day at the Department of State, which is our annual moment to pause and honor our colleagues' contributions. I'd like to recognize Consular Affairs Deputy Assistant Secretary Douglas Benning, who brought today's story to light, drafting the nomination of the four hero honorees with us today. I'd also like to take a moment to honor the memory of the 11 US government employees and the many embassy family members who died during the Haiti earthquake on January 12th, 2010. In particular, we'd like to recognize Victoria DeLong. She was a friend and colleague of our honorees who served as the cultural affairs officer at Embassy Port-au-Prince and died inside her home when the earthquake hit. Victoria was devoted to the mission of the Department of State and beloved by her colleagues and the many youth exchange participants, scholars, professionals, journalists, community, community leaders, and individuals she befriended around the world. Today, we are honored to recognize Foreign Service Officers Shannon Farrell, Dominic Randazzo, Roger Rigaud, and Jennifer Savage as heroes of U.S. diplomacy for their bravery and dedication in serving U.S. citizens who are affected by the devastating Haiti earthquake. They worked around the clock to assist in the massive consular operations that led to the evacuation of 16,200 U.S. citizens back to safety. They performed work that was physically and emotionally difficult, working 16 to 20 hour shifts, sleeping under desks in the embassy, and often eating just one meal a day while supporting the repatriation of Americans who were still in country. It's wonderful that we have so many Department of, senior Department of State leaders joining us today to help celebrate our honorees and commemorate this occasion. Thank you to Nicole Thirio, our DCM in Haiti, for joining us. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our colleagues and friends joining us remotely from U.S. Embassy Port-au-Prince. I'd also like to thank the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support for the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative. Thank you in particular to Lino Gutierrez, Executive De Director of the Cox Foundation, as well as Cox Trustee Larry Wood for joining us today. In addition, I'd like to thank our partners in the bureaus of global talent management and consular affairs for joining with us to bring this deeply moving story to life for today's program. And finally, I'm honored to welcome today's speakers. Acting Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs, Ian Brownlee, will introduce our honorees and provide some context for these consular officers' heroic work. I note that Acting Assistant Secretary Brownlee and the entire Consular Affairs Bureau are them, themselves heroes of diplomacy, and recently were recognized as a Service to America Medal finalist for their leadership of the interagency COVID repatriation team. You can still vote for them, so please do so. Um, and congratulations and thank you to CA for your astounding work over the last year in response to the COVID crisis. We also are very fortunate to have with us today Ambassador Ken Merton, who led the US government's on the ground response as our US ambassador to Haiti during the time of the earthquake. Ambassador Merton currently serves as the Senior Bureau Official for Global Talent Management and will guide the discussion with our honorees. And now I'm pleased to turn the program over to Acting Assistant Secretary for Consular Affairs, Ian Brownlee. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ambassador Palaszczuk, for welcoming me and for providing that overview of the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative. Thank you also to Ambassador Gutierrez and the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for their generous support for this program. The Bureau of Consular Affairs is, frankly, the public face of the State Department for millions of people all over the world. We're responsible for the issuance of passports and other documents to U.S. citizens and nationals and for the protection of U.S. border security and the facilitation of legitimate travel to the United States. However, our number one priority is the welfare and protection of U.S. citizens abroad, which is why I am so humbled and honored to recognize these four worthy recipients. Our consular officers are stationed all over the world and ready to help, whether it's a small crisis affecting one American or a huge disaster affecting thousands and they often do so at very great personal risk. On January 10, 2010, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake struck Haiti, resulting in large scale destruction in Port-au-Prince and around the country. And over the following months, the Department of State evacuated over 16,000 US citizens on over 240 flights. Throughout the, the evacuation, consular officers such as Shannon Farrell, Dominic Randasso, Roger Rigaud, and Jennifer Savage did extraordinary work under the most challenging circumstances to ensure Americans and their families returned safely to the United States. As the ambassador said, the work was physically grueling and often emotional. People came to the embassy seeking not only consular services, but also medical care, financial help, refuge, food and water, advice, and even emotional support. In addition to managing the large scale evacuation, the team also helped locate missing or deceased US citizens, notified families of both good and bad news about their loved ones. They facilitated the finalization of adoptions so children could come to their forever homes in the United States. They supported visits from high profile public and private figures, and they visited Americans in hospitals. The consular team worked around the clock to assist earthquake victims despite suffering personal trauma, including as we heard the loss of embassy colleagues and severe injuries to other members of the community, even the destructions of their homes, and in some cases, total loss of their earthly possessions. Today, Shannon, Dominic, Roger, and Jennifer are here representing the service, dedication, and bravery displayed by all consular officers responding to the earthquake and the contribution of consular work to diplomacy worldwide. Their stories serve as an inspiration to the entire consular corps, and they truly embody the, the uh, Bureau and Department's mission to protect Americans overseas. I would now like to introduce Global Talent Management's Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, Ambassador Kenneth Merton, who will interview our honorees about their heroic efforts. Over to you. Thanks so much, Ian. I appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you, uh, uh, Ambassador Polishik and, and everybody else. Uh, really, it's a great honor. Uh, it's it's also a great honor to be here again and to see uh, to see Dominic and 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 Roger and Shannon and Jennifer again. Um, it's been a little bit of time, a little water under the bridge for some of us, but uh, it's great to see you. And I'm glad you're being recognized for your outstanding work. As, as Ian mentioned, I was fortunate enough to be the uh, chief of mission in Port-au-Prince. Um, I had arrived there in August. The earthquake was in January. It was my first uh, COM job, and uh, I had served twice before in Haiti, so I knew the country well. Haiti was going through one of its uh, periodic uh, general upturns in, in its, its uh, fortunes. The economy was growing reasonably well. Uh, uh, things were going pretty, pretty well on the political side of the house. Development was going on. There was some investment coming in. Nevertheless, it remained a uh, a country with with deep challenges, uh, ranging from demographic challenges to economic challenges to, frankly, uh, an infrastructure uh, which was just not able to to support. Um, the Haitian people or the economic growth that they needed. And that was before the earthquake. But uh, we were, I think, a, a 
well-functioning embassy team prior to the uh, prior to the earthquake. And then, of course, that night, that afternoon, uh, we were we were confronted with something that I think many of us never expected to have to confront. Uh, I happened to have been out that day with the visiting uh, general from Southcom, General Ken Keen. We had been to Cité Soleil and to Martissant, two areas which were uh, which we had been doing some great work in to bring uh, peace and security to some of the most downtrodden and poorest areas of Port-au-Prince. And we had just got back, um, General Keen and I, uh, and sat down to have a Coke when the earthquake struck. Um, the amazing thing was, was after, I think it was 45 seconds of this incredible noise and this incredible agitation, for the first few seconds, it was quiet. Uh, the traffic that you normally heard was quiet. People had stopped. And for a minute, you didn't hear anything. And then you saw coming up from the valleys, this dust rising, not settling, but rising up into the sky. Uh, General Keene had had two uh, staffers join him, both of whom were staying at the Hotel Montana, which was over in the next uh, hill. You could see it from uh, one of the sides of the residence. So we ran over there to see what had happened to the hotel. Normally a, a five-story hotel, which was a landmark on top of that hill, um, was invisible. There was only dust rising and we feared for the lives of his two colleagues, one of whom did perish in, uh, in the collapse of the hotel. The other uh, who we were able to rescue and who spent the night at the residence uh, being tended by some of my colleagues and my wife and one of my daughters uh, for his, his pretty serious wounds. Um, it was an incredible night. We all spent the night outside because there were a lot of very violent aftershocks. We had been planning to have a reception for General Keen. Uh, some folks had been able to make it there already. We had about uh, between 40 and 50 people sleeping outside uh, at the residence that night. And it was amazing that um, in the middle of the night at about two o'clock in the morning, you could hear people uh, in some parts of town, and I still to this day don't know exactly where this came from, singing hymns. And of course there was no electricity, there was no light, um, but people were singing hymns and probably being thankful for the fact that they had survived. Um, the next day, uh, we were able to get most of the embassy dependents out, and frankly, anybody we allowed to go who who felt they couldn't continue on uh, from the embassy team. Many of our uh, locally engaged staff were um, needed to deal with their own family tragedies. I, I remember, uh, you know, one of my bodyguards who happened to be with me that day uh, earlier in the day. Um, he lost his entire family except for one of his sons, his wife and his other children died. They were crushed in the earthquake. And it, uh, it was really, really sad to see him, incredibly sad to see him at the embassy later on that night, the, the following day actually, um, just there with his only surviving son. And he was one of many folks who, who, uh, who suffered terrible loss. Uh, at the end of the day, I think somewhere between 200 and 300,000 people perished. Um, so the, the needs were great. We were terrified that, that, that Haiti wouldn't have enough potable water, have enough to eat, and that people wouldn't have shelter. And, and, and to this day, I remain deeply proud of the work that all our colleagues did, not only from State Department, but from USAID and the U.S. military, who did, uh, and, and frankly, an unbelievable uh, performed an unbelievable task to make sure that people got enough to eat, got enough water, and got enough shelter. And uh, for those people, those American citizens who wanted to leave, they were able to leave. We had um, our embassy, we had within about a week, we probably had, I guess, around 3,000 people sleeping on every flat surface inside and outside of the embassy. Um, it was just me and my dog. Uh, my family had, uh, had left. And uh, there was a lot, there was a lot to do. Anyway, I don't want to belabor the point. I think you get the picture. Um, I do want to say that it's, it's great to have uh, these four colleagues here. You know, I, I am so happy that they're being recognized for their outstanding work. 
I also want to note there are many other folks, uh, including particularly our uh, locally engaged staff who uh, who performed miracles uh, during the the weeks after the earthquake, and uh, you know their their the recognition of these four heroes is frankly symbolic of the recogni recognition for the larger group in my view. But anyway, um, thank you very much for for allowing me to set the scene a little bit. Maybe I could. Uh, have a chance to uh, to talk and present each one of these uh, these heroes to the larger group. Um, maybe if you could get your cameras on, please. Very good. I'll um, I'll start with, if I could, with with Dominic. Dominic uh, of of the four folks here today was was uh, actually assigned a post. And um, he, he was a, a first tour officer and uh, was doing already before the earthquake, fantastic work. Um, but he, uh, frankly, as I had done 25 years prior, was a first tour officer and uh, starting out in Haiti. And um, he, um, he performed just miraculous work in those, those days after the earthquake. I, I think that um, he, uh, this experience was transformative for, for him. And, and maybe Dominic, I'll let you say a little bit about what this earthquake experience meant for you, not just the quake itself, but the aftermath and your work with your colleagues. Thank you, Ambassador Burton. It's wonderful to see you again. Uh, just to echo your message, I am honored to be recognized among the hundreds of consular professionals, both American and Haitian, who did such incredible work in the earthquake, um, during and, and after the earthquake. You mentioned your, your, um, your bodyguard, Dominic, and I don't know if you and I have ever discussed this before, but the night of the earthquake, I went to the airport to see if the runway was functional and if we could use it um, to land planes. Eventually we did, that's the, the one runway that we used to evacuate the 16,000 American citizens um, over the coming weeks. I um, mean, on the way back from the airport, uh, I was driving with an, a motor pool driver and, and we came across a man and, and a young boy on the side of the road. And that was Dominic um, and, and his son. And Dominic, his hands were badly, badly beaten up. Um, he told me that he had Doug tried to dig out um, his wife and, and two children from their house um, after it had collapsed. And Dominic's son was complaining of some severe abdominal pain. So I, I rushed them as quickly as possible to the nearby UN hospital, um, which was a scene that I will never forget. Um, it was uh, a scene of, of true carnage with alive and, and um, badly injured folks, but also people that had died along the road outside the hospital, inside the hospital. Um, and I, I got in touch with the main, the lead doctor uh, for, for the UN hospital, and he said they just wouldn't be able to help Dominic's son. So we rushed back to the embassy uh, where Dr. Steve Harris, the CDC chief for the country, um, was working. Uh, Steve had not done a medical practice or, or clinical work since the year that I was born. I um, mean, he was leading a, a triage unit in, inside the, the um, embassy's cafeteria, uh, and he examined Dominic's son and, and learned that he was just in shock and, and that's very fortunate. And my, that night my wife scrubbed Dominic's wounds and cleaned out his hands thoroughly um, in order to, to make sure that he did not develop a bad infection. And that treatment unit for the next day was critical and it, it saved the lives of, of many American citizens who were badly hurt in the earthquake uh, along with our colleague Dominic. Um, so I just want to recognize the, the contributions of folks like my wife um, and, and other concert professionals in, in Haiti. You asked about um, how this experience uh, influenced me. I, I came to, to Port-au-Prince as a political officer. I thought I would do my consular tour and that I would be going on to policy work where I would be doing the real work of the foreign service that people think about, the bilateral negotiation, the representing the United States to host governments. It was during the earthquake that I recognized the power of consular work and how one minute of a consular officer's time or any consular professional's time can really result in incredible changes um, and benefits uh, to American citizens and others and how many lives were saved during the earthquake because of the work that we did. Um, and, and that really, really struck me. I also saw incredible leadership, uh, leadership that I had never seen before. Um, folks like uh, Paul Mayer and Meredith McAvoy who were sent in to run our, our earthquake response 
by the department um, from the, the concert perspective. These people remain some of my closest mentors today. Um, Haitian colleagues like Dominique Gerdes, who in 2010 was selected as the department's LE staff member of the year, um, who was an inspiration from the beginning for me and who I've kept in contact since, but also all of our Haitian locally engaged staff colleagues inside the concert section who showed um, incredible dedication uh, to, to our work, um, working through the most difficult circumstances. So coming full circle, uh, a few years after Haiti, I decided to switch cones to become a concert officer as my career. Um, and today I'm, I'm really pleased and honored to mentor and advise concert teams across Africa, where I attempt to show and demonstrate the same level of leadership um, and compassion that, that was shown in Haiti by our leaders and, and the people all around me. Um, so Haiti has had a profound impact on my career. Thanks so much, Dominic. I appreciate that. Why don't I go next to um, an old friend and colleague of mine, uh, Roger Rigaud. Uh, I know Roger for a long time. We had the, uh, my part anyway, the, the pleasure of uh, serving together uh, at the embassy in Port-au-Prince, uh, my second tour. Uh, and it was, I believe, his first tour in the Foreign Service. Um, he did a, a stint in the concert section and then moved to econ where he and I worked together. Um, but Roger was, I was so delighted when I heard that, that Roger was going to be on the ground because I, I knew he knew the place well and knew exactly what was, what was going to be, what was going to be needed. I had followed Roger's career and know he had done some terrific work in a number of other places. So I, I, um, I, I know he's been involved in other uh, difficult situations since uh, before and, and after the Haitian earthquake. But I wanted to ask maybe how did your prior work uh, in a crisis shape your response during the, the work in the 2010 earthquake? And, you know, one of the things I thought was really important was, you know, for, particularly for those of us who were at post and, and stayed there, was to take little steps getting back to normalcy. And, you um, it's why we started almost immediately looking for new houses to get to get embassy staff in. I don't know. Are there anything that you particularly remember that was that was useful that that gave you that little blinks of normalcy in the middle of this uh, this horrific scene? Well, merci, beau chef. It's always good to see you as well. Uh, prior to Haiti, it was only one major thing which I was involved in. Now the 2006 evacuation from Lebanon, where we took citizens out from the war there and brought them to Turkey and to Cyprus. And that kind of helped me understand what kind of resources we can bring as a department to help Americans overseas. But I sent my consular team to Mersin, the port city in Turkey, and I had to stay back in the embassy coordinating the effort from there. And so the night of the earthquake, I was in El Paso, Texas, of all places, uh, going back to my, my then current post, Ciudad Juarez, and I got the news that the earthquake has struck and I got home and I told my wife, we were relatively new to it back then that uh, I'm, I'll be going to Haiti tomorrow. Either the department's gonna call me, I'm gonna call the department, and I'm going to be there to try to help. And for me, the reason was that having served my first tour in Haiti and being of Haitian descent, it was not just a catastrophe on television. It was a visceral, real thing for me. And I had to go and do what I could do to help my colleagues and friends who, who were still there. Uh, having walked the streets and seen the embassy and the, not the new one at the time, but remembering downtown in my apartment, the Clo, having been in the consul general's house, which I heard had collapsed. I just knew that I can probably help out with some real knowledge and see where I can get there. And so that kind of helped me get my bearings, even though I still was not prepared for the other, for lack of a better word, chaos that greeted us when we landed at the airport that night with Jennifer and the sort that's the condition of our colleague who were already exhausted trying to get flights and people organized um, and trying to get to and fro the embassy. It was quite a challenge, but still, I knew that a lot of resources could be brought to bear, and I just want to be part of that resource that could help out the situation on the ground. It's, um, it's, it's true. We do a lot of help in my career. I've seen a lot of American citizen cases on the one-on-one -on offs, but when it's a massive situation like that, it's just it's just a, a different scale that you just want to make sure that your full talents are being used there. I first was in, the, in Santo Domingo where I first landed, translating from Spanish to Creole to help the initial evacuees explain to doctors what wounds they had. 
And once that started, I remember Jennifer tapped me on the shoulder saying, hey, they want us to go on that C-130. We're going into Port-au-Prince. I went, okay, let's do it. We hopped on a plane and went in. So just the opportunity to help um, and participate. And again, just remember that this was just not a faraway place that's on the nightly news that's suffering, but someplace I, I love, someplace I've been, and someplace where I just knew that I had to help out. Over. That's absolutely true. And Port-au-Prince, as you correctly pointed out, I, I think in one of the interviews I did, it was, you know, the, the center of town was vaporized. And, um, you know, it, it, there were there were blocks in part of the city where there was nothing left standing, literally nothing, just piles of rubble. Um, you know, I, I you raise a good point, And I, I think that you had many colleagues, as you say, even when you got there shortly after the, the actual event, um, I, I think, you know, people, people suffered burnout actually very quickly because the pressure, the sheer volume of people and work, I don't know if you, you saw some of that yourself and, um, you know, if, if that made a difference to you seeing the, the, the burnout and particularly in how you manage people today as, as a, um, as, as a, you know, as a consular leader. It did. It, um, you had to remember that people are human. And even in these crises, even when you're doing your best there, you're not going to be as aware of how tired you are in these situations. And in my particular case, literally two months after returning from Haiti, we went to a trauma in Ciudad Juarez, where one of, two of our colleagues were murdered in the violence that was engulfing the city then. But at that time, as a concert leader in Juarez, I was somewhat better prepared to recognize the immediate signs of burnout and to remember and realize that that tragedy was going to hit people differently. Everyone's going to have a different reaction, but we had to prepare and again, help the team get through it and call for help from Washington if we needed people to come in either for, you know, to, for counseling purposes, to replace staff, to give people time off, et cetera. And so while these responses, I'm always a proud member of the concert corps and I the, the State Department family, the Sweet Accord that we have to carry out this mission, I think we learned a lot from Haiti that we had to take care of our own as we're taking care of others as well. And it's something that I just keep in mind as I go forward in my career. That's great. Why don't I move, move on to, um, to Shannon. Shannon, I know another Haiti veteran who, who knew the country well. And, and you know we were so glad you were able to, to participate um, and, and to come and, and not lend a hand, but lend two hands and then some. But uh, I, I want to say I, I notice, uh, at least behind you, I see some Haitian art. I think there may be a story behind that, but maybe you want to share with us a little bit some of the things that you found that were very particularly moving and, and had an impact on you and your career moving forward. Sure. Uh, well, I was one of the flyaway teams um, that was tapped to uh, go to Haiti after the earthquake. I, I think Roger and um, Jen got there the day before us, and there's a photo of uh, Meredith McAvoy, who um, Dom had mentioned, and, and Paul Mayer on the far right, who um, was to become the acting uh, consul general there during the time, the, the two weeks that I, I was on the ground with uh, Roger and Jen and, and Dominic, and then Jane Howell as well was a, was a great colleague of ours that, that also, you know, made incredible contributions. But I think for us, when we spent, you know, we flew into the Dominican Republic, um, and then spent the night with, uh, with our colleague who was assigned there to the uh, embassy. And he was gracious and provided us our last hot meal for, for two weeks. Um, but it was flying over um, from the Dominican Republic and then into Haiti. And then you could just see the devastation um, from up above. And you know when we finally landed um, at the embassy compound, um, to see that 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 was you know the the one building that was really from the outside completely intact, um, it, you know it, it really it, even to this day it just um, I just remember that visual in, in my mind uh, and thinking you know there's there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of things that that are going on um, and just wanting to be able to to add value in a, in a way um, 
and to make a difference. Roger and I um, had worked together uh, on the Lebanon evacuation. We were both in Ankara. And so I was fortunate that I was paired up with Roger because we had worked together so closely in, in Turkey that we really, you know, it was kind of a mind meld in certain things that I could just look at him and, and we kind of knew, okay, I got to do that. You got to do this. Um, we were at the airport together and he was for a long time, you know, we called it the, the front end with the military. And I was helping to check in just these throngs of Americans and, um, you know, their escorts that came just to the embassy desperate um, to get on these evacuation flights. Uh, and, you know, it, it was a lot of heartbreaking moments because, you know, we had to make sure that, that we could document them um, as Americans uh, to, to get on to these flights. Um, you know, and sometimes they just didn't have that. And, you know, it, it's a judgment call that you make in a moment. And I think that's one of the biggest takeaways for me. I, I was just a, kind of a newly minted uh, mid-level officer. And I realized that we were, we were charged with, you know, making these really kind of life and death decisions. And um, so as I progressed in my career and I, I realized, you know, you can, you can teach a lot of skills to people that come into the foreign service, but the one thing that you can never teach people is, is good judgment. And I think for me, that was like the remarkable thing that I'll take away. And, and Dom was a first tour officer and, and we all, you know, remember Dom because, you know, he lost a colleague. He was there when the earthquake happened, you know, and Jen and Roger and I weren't. And to see him, you know, being effective at the same level as people, you know, that were more senior to him, um, it, it was humbling. And to mention the art behind me, um, there was a moment where there, you know, there wasn't as many Americans coming and evacuated just you know, thousands in, in one day. And then I was there with my colleague from diplomatic security, who again, I just, I wanna acknowledge the role that the diplomatic security played. I mean, we couldn't have done our jobs as consular officers had we not had these people there, you know, to, to assist us and protect us and to make sure that, you know, things went smoothly. Um, and so this gentleman kind of waved over and, and wanted to approach us. And the diplomatic security person said, you know, who was this? And he had two large canvases. And I said, let's go see what he has to say. And, you know, he, he spoke English um, and, and said, please, uh, you know, I, I want you to have this artwork. And, you know, we unrolled them, and looked at them and we just said, this is, you know, this is incredible, but, you know, we don't have the money. I think combined between us, we had $30 uh, in cash. And he just said, please, I don't even, it's not about the money. I just, I, I've lost everything and this is all I have. And I just really want you to bring this art back and to, to, for people to remember, you know, what art and who is, is about. And, uh, you know, that just was a humbling moment for me that amidst all this tragedy and devastation, you know, it was like when you, um, Ambassador Merton, we're talking about people singing the hymns. It's like his two pieces of artwork survived and he wanted to make sure, you know, that that was his legacy. And, you know, I remember taking an R&R &R after um, my two weeks lady and my dad and I went and we took this to a frame store in our house. And he then sent it to me in Argentina where I was serving at the time. And it has gone with me with for every uh, tour that I have had in the Foreign Service. Um, it's it's my reminder of resilience and hopefulness in times of, of tragedy and devastation. That is a great story. I, I really I really appreciate hearing that. Um, you know, you mentioned that that you made some tough calls during the crisis. Are there any any in particular that you particularly remember making? Um, well, it was one that. Um, Washington had made, uh, and it may have predated that they decided, you know, for financial reasons that it would have been better to bus Americans over land from Haiti to the Dominican Republic and didn't realize maybe how quickly, you know, um, the U.S. government would mobilize, especially our, our military colleagues. Just, I, I can't say enough about the Coast Guard and the Air Force uh, and, and the colleagues that we worked with during that time. And so, I mean, they, they had it down to kind of a well-oiled machine in terms of getting even commercial flights coming in and, and being able to evacuate Americans that way. But then one day, it was like a week in, uh, you know, I got a tap on the shoulder and was told that um, we need to put Americans on these buses. And I said, well, we have a C-117 and a C-130 here. I'm not going to put Americans on a bus when they can fly directly back to the United States. Um, and there was a very kind lieutenant colonel from the Air Force who we've been working with. I'm sure Roger remembers him. And, you know, he, he pulled me aside and he said, 
this comes from very high up. You need, I think for your career, you need to put some Americans on a bus. And uh, so, you know, we kind of huddled and agreed, okay, let's, let's put one bus with Americans, you know, that are very able-bodied and that will be able to withstand this, you know, several hours over, you know, this terrain. Uh, and then we went back to the embassy and the acting CG Paul Mayer, we told him about this. And I said, can I write back to Washington and say, we can't do this. This is, we have all these, these airplanes. This is not good for American citizens. And the next day we got an email that they had turned off the buses. So it, it's a takeaway for any younger foreign service officers or anybody out there, like speak up. Sometimes Washington thinks they know best, but you actually are on the ground and you have the ground truth and don't be afraid to push back. That's excellent. Yeah, completely agree. Let me move on to, to Jen Savage last, but definitely not least in this group. It's so great to see you again. Um, and uh, I'm so glad you're being recognized for, for your work. Um, you, know, you were also kind enough to, to come into Haiti and really help folks out in, in, in a moment of dire, dire need. Um, how did your, maybe you could tell a little bit about your story uh, in Haiti there and, and maybe about how this experience uh, when you were a mid-level officer affect you? Did, has it been helpful for you as a, as a charge, for example, now? Thank you so much, Ambassador. Yes, as everyone has said, it's so good to, to see you and to see everyone again. Um, the process of this award has, has renewed some connections and it's been lovely to see everybody. Um, so a bit of my experience in Haiti, my experience ranged um, from the chaos at the airport on the first night with just throngs of Americans um, seeking uh, evacuation and no system of organization, um, an airport on the brink of, of uh, ceiling collapses and, and pipes burst everywhere. So we were setting up what turned out to be gates on the tarmac. Um, ranged from that to just thousands of people. There's one of our gates uh, displayed now. Um, then at the embassy itself, thousands of people lined up out front um, and um, uh, sleeping on every inch were Americans who had come in to assist from the US government on every inch of the embassy property. And then you crossed a line into the public facing areas and the, the waiting area for consular services. And that again, every inch was covered with someone there seeking assistance, seeking service. Um, I remember one particularly um, striking moment. Um, I think I'd been working, you know, 20, 30 hours in a row at that point, um, but finally catching some sleep um, one of the things that we did was assist um, adopted children to have their paperwork finalized. There were several just in those last stages of being adopted. Their American families were desperate to be reunited with their, with their children um, and just having to get that paperwork done. And we worked with our colleagues at US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And I had, after many, many hours, curled up under a cubicle in the consular section. Work was still going on around me but the phone kept ringing on the desk above my head. Um, and so I picked myself up and answered the phone and it turned out um, someone from an adoption agency who had brought 11 children over uh, to have their paperwork finalized, spent many, many hours in the waiting room with the children um, getting the paperwork finalized. She'd gotten to the airport and realized she had only 10 children with her. So she was back at the front of the embassy in an absolute panic. So she and I went into the consular waiting room um, three or four in the morning again, still abuzz with activity, crowded with people. Um, but in one corner, we found the generosity and the care of, of people in crisis was remarkable. People had sort of blockaded off uh, for the child's safety, a little corner of the waiting area. The child had a full belly, the child had a clean diaper. Clearly uh, other folks in the waiting room had been caring for the child, um, but no one would take credit for that um, when we asked around in the embassy. But this um, woman from the adoption agency has swooped up the child in her arms. She was so grateful, ran to the airport and evacuated all 11 children um, to be reunited with their forever families in the US. It was a really touching moment. 
It's an incredible story. And can you, I mean, you can just imagine that woman from the adoption agency, how terrified she must have been. I mean, for this poor, for this child. That's incredible. I, I, um, I don't know if you have any other stories about your time there, uh, you know, after the earthquake, we weren't able to put you up in five-star luxury at the embassy. I'm afraid. No, it wasn't five-star luxury, but we were uh, in the consular section where we needed to be. Um, and I have to say um, full credit to the State Department construction engineers and Office of Overseas Building Operations with the devastation that was around us um, in Haiti, everywhere you looked, buildings had collapsed, structural failures everywhere. And the embassy stood strong with power, with lights on, with running water. And it was a true beacon to almost everyone. That is how sort of people were attracted when, when the, the desperate injured folks were looking for assistance. Um, the only place with lights on and running water, they gravitated towards it. Um, and it was a, a striking thing. And, and I felt very comfortable to be in the safety of those walls um, and, and in that shelter. I also remember the kindness of others and the resilience and how we all pulled together. I was so touched by um, the creativity. We had our Miami Passport Agency, which is still to this day uh, directed by Ryan Dooley, they, were, they knew that evacuation flights were taking off from Miami and going down to Haiti. And so they called us up and said, hey, we're gonna send some staff, sort of like day laborers to help you out for a day. Um, and what do you need? And we were able to ask for the forgotten toothpaste, the fresh fruit that we hadn't seen in a week. <laughs> um, so just just the, the very simple necessities. Um, uh, and uh, that was so kind of them to think, to just call us and say, what do you need? Um, and then of course, to come in and stand shoulder to shoulder with us doing that work and then depart in the evening with one of the, the last flights with evacuees that day and turn around and go to the grocery store again on their way back in for another day. Um, so it was really remarkable the way people pulled together. Yeah, no, I, I agree hundred percent. That's That's great. You know, I have a number of other uh, questions here that have been submitted to us by both CA and colleagues in the operations center. Maybe I'll just uh, choose a couple of these at random and then, you know, uh, pose the questions to to each one of you. Um, and I, I start with uh, with Dominic. Is, is there a, a particular image uh, picture you have in your head of, of that period of, of the earthquake? I mean, is it, is it the airport? Is it your house? Is it the embassy? Or is it something else? That's, that's a good question, Ambassador. Um, my, yeah, I, I do. Um, I, I have this image of us after the earthquake and even maybe a couple of weeks after the, the crisis operations ended, when we went back to normal, um, we were going back to routine, routine work um, to a great extent. So continuing to process visas for those who are immigrating to the United States or visiting the United States, um, which was a big part of our work. You know, all of the members of our community um, and the country were truly suffering. And, and as we've discussed previously today, um, none of us were truly normal because we had lost um, our possessions or our homes. We had lost friends. Um, for example, all of us who knew someone at the UN, all of our colleagues at the UN had died in the same room in the same building when it collapsed. Uh, many of our Haitian colleagues had lost family members, um, had lost their homes. Um, we, we were all affected deeply. And so we started taking care of each other, both in the section and, and outside of the section. And I remember Liz Harris Allered, who was our fraud prevention manager, she had an open door policy at her house. And so a lot of us ended up at her house almost every night um, after the earthquake for many months where we would have a drink and talk and, and be together because none of us wanted to go to our empty homes. Um, and and it, it was powerful, the, the, the camaraderie, the community that was created in, in that situation. And it really taught me a lesson that, that that community is everything and that our number one job is really to take care of each other, um, not only our peers, but also the people that report to us, the people who work for us. And that's something that I've worked to, to model in each of my subsequent assignments in the Foreign Service. Yeah, that's absolutely true, 100% uh, true. That's terrific. Um, why don't we move next to, to Roger? Uh, you, you mentioned you're, you were a... Uh, uh, 
Haitian American, you, you Haitian ancestry. And, and I wonder, um, you know, it must have been for you and your family uh, a kind of a very emotional reaction when people in the States or uh, in the border region first saw those pictures of the earthquake. I mean, you, you guys probably saw them before we did because I know I, at the residence, had no access to anything um, at, at first. It was hard for me to understand, except through the embassy radio, how bad the damage was. But And, and did that sort of emotional impact uh, did it have any effect on, on how you were able to do the job or obviously on the motivation of you to want to do it, but, but once you were there, did it have an impact on you? It did. It was, uh, constantly on my mind wondering how my dad's hometown of Tigua was. It was, um, wondering how, you know, family poor were doing. I mean, the, 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 um, the visual image of seeing the national palace collapsed on the nightly news in Texas sticks in my head still. But on the flip side, the Maron statue was still standing. So it, it just felt me with pride there too. And one of the early people I saw at the embassy was um, a guard who worked in the Clue where I lived when I lived in Haiti, who was from Tigua. And I saw him while I was coming to the embassy one evening and he had been promoted in the guard force and so happy to see me. And I asked him, have you heard anything from, from Tigua? He said, it's bad down there, but you know, go do your job. We're doing our job, you know, can be read um, And I held on to that and I tried to keep the two things going, feeding my family any information I could while focusing on the job at hand. But it wasn't, it, I, I can't pretend I didn't cross my mind every day I was at the airport, every decision as Shannon made, you know, when it's saying, this is going to have an impact on this person's life. And I let's try to make the best decision possible here uh, and just keep, you know, keep, keep the, the bigger picture in focus so that we can help as many people as possible in a time of need. Yeah, I, I have to say that that that's that's super interesting. I, I have to say I was amazed to find out that you know every at everybody's residence in Port-au-Prince, um, we had local guards, and I'll be honest with you, these folks are not the highest paid uh, amongst the embassy staff, and. In every case, those guys, I think I would say 90% of them are guys, there are some women, those folks stayed at their post to protect the property and protect the people, even in cases where the house had collapsed or was badly damaged. And I, I just have tremendous respect for the, the people's honor and dignity for doing that and, and their, their um their, their attachment, frankly, to the embassy and to, to our mission in Haiti. And I, I thought that for me, that was super touching. Um, why don't we go on to, to Shannon? Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you here, this is a question from the operations center. Um, what was your, perhaps your proudest moment? And is there anything you would have done differently while you were there now that you look at, back on it with 10 years distance? Um, you know, the proudest moment, it's hard to, to have, you know, just one single moment. I think the partnership, uh, that I developed with one of the local staff very quickly when I was, um, working, checking in people that were lined up at the embassy, um, you know, there were a lot of Creole speakers. I don't speak Creole. Um, and the, uh, rapport that we developed to be able to help as many people, I think that that has stayed with me and the fact that, you know, uh, he taught me a lot. He, he was a newer employee uh, of the embassy and he had, you know, lost most of his family. And, um, you know, I, I just said, if you ever just need to, you know, take time out or, or leave or, you know, find out about other family members. And he said, no, you know, this is what's kind of keeping me going. This, you know, being able to, to contribute and give back. He said, I can't bring them back. Um, but I can help these people and be reunited with family members and things like that. And, you know, it was, it was very humbling. And so I'm proud of, you know, just coming on, on the ground as a flyaway team and having that relationship um, with, with this gentleman who I just, you know, uh, think the world of from my time with him. Yeah. Understood. Um, Jen, question for you, this one also from um, the Op Center. 
uh, in your time there after the earthquake, uh, how much were you engaged with Washington and, and what tools did you find helpful and, and any thoughts for improvement in engagement with Washington after an event like this? Well, I had recently uh, come out of serving in Washington in um, the Executive Office of, C of Consular Affairs, where we do uh, the resources and uh, for consular sections overseas. Um, and I was sort of in many ways a touch point back to that office to define the resources that we need. So I had pretty frequent phone calls. Um, and email exchanges um, with um, both the folks in the operations center and with consular affairs. Um, we were quick to, uh, Washington was asking for lists. What do you need? What do you need? And we needed cots. We were sleeping on the floor. We needed um, tents to keep um, the, the evacuees sheltered from the hot sun. We needed water. We needed food, baby formula, all kinds of things. Um, and so we were in frequent contact um, sending those lists back. Um, I think a, a, a lesson learned um, was, I think, the adrenaline of, of when, you, when you go into that situation. Um, Roger and I arrived on the same flight and literally did not put our bags down, just looked at our colleagues who had just lost so much and were still trying to organize an evacuation and got to work. And okay, what do we do? Okay, we're creating manifests for planes, we're creating lists, that's great, let's get to work. Um, and that diving right into it, we spent probably the first 36 hours just all working 100% flat out. And it didn't take long before we suddenly realized, you know what, we need to create shifts. We need to give people time off. We need to organize into teams. We need to think about the various functions and just everybody going 100% straight at the problem wasn't actually as efficient as let's divide up, divide into functions, teams, and give people a shift and some downtime. Um, so I sort of wish we'd done that sooner. I think our instinct and the adrenaline was just driving us to act. Um, and, I, and I've learned to, to take that deep breath and, and start to just put some, some organization, put a system in place um, to channel that, that energy. That's good advice. I, I will say, just to contribute my for another story of another great consular officer, Don Moore, who had been the uh, consular uh, chief, actually the consul general in Port-au-Prince uh, at the time of the earthquake. He, uh, his house was destroyed and he was working, I, I would say probably 23 hours a day for like the first, I don't know, you know 10 days, two weeks after the earthquake. And we've, finally realized that he was just not doing well. I mean, he was just physically tired. I think his, you know, he was just overwhelmed by everything. And so we, we, we forced him to leave the country. We wanted him to stay out for two weeks. He was gone for about three or four days. He went to Miami and uh, after about four days, we saw him back in the embassy compound. He had come back through Santo Domingo. And I remember the, DCM and I talked to him, I was like, what are you doing back? You were supposed to be gone. He said, I kept watching this on TV in my hotel room and I could, I kept thinking I had to be helping. And so he came back and we had to force him to take a, uh, some leave further away. And we really had to force him to leave. And he was able to, uh, to, to make a trip to Europe and did disconnect for a while. And he came back, back his old, you know, efficient self, but uh, it, it affects people, these events. So yeah, your point is well taken. Uh, we're almost out of time here. Um, I, I think, why don't I just uh, uh, just say once again, thank you to all of you and, and through you, thank you to all the uh, outstanding concert professionals who, who uh, really saved lives, saved people's well-being and, and made such an incredible difference not only to American citizens in Haiti, but to, to Haitians in Haiti. And um, certainly as, as ambassador, you really made me proud and, and you made us look good. And uh, I, I wanna say thank you to, to the four of you and thank you to all of your colleagues uh, who, who you represent here today, both uh, American and locally engaged staff. 
And uh, again, it's been really an honor and a pleasure and a privilege to be uh, to be able to share this screen with with you all. And with that, I will turn it back over to uh, Ambassador Palashik and let her make some remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Merton, and, and thank you to our panelists, Roger, uh, Dominic, Jennifer, and Shannon. I am so moved by everything that you shared. I, I frankly feel a little exhausted um, after listening to the remarkable journey that you all went through, the tragedies that you, you endured, the, the enormous service that you provided to American citizens and I think to many, many Haitian citizens. Um, Dominic's story in particular about helping his locally engaged staff colleague and his son was, was particularly moving. And um, as I said at, at the top of this event, it just feels so appropriate to recognize all of you today on, on Foreign Affairs Day, the moment where we, we honor and reflect uh, the amazing contributions of our colleagues all, all over the world. And um, thank you for everything that you've done. And I just wanna say thank you to all of our consular colleagues throughout the world, our, our American staff, our locally engaged staff, because today we've focused on one very intense, uh, very important snapshot of consular work, but I, know that every day throughout the world, people in our embassies and consulates are doing equally heroic work, taking care of American citizens and responding to crises. So for all of our consular colleagues out there, thank you. And uh, our, our four honorees today and Ambassador Merton himself, who was leading this really complicated mission at a really challenging time, you all are heroes and you, you represent the heroic work that, that all of our consular colleagues throughout the world World do. So thank you for this really special discussion today. Um, and that unfortunately brings our, our uh, event for today to a close. Um, I hope that for those of you who are new uh, to this series, this has piqued your interest in the Heroes of Diplomacy Initiative. If you'd like more information about the Heroes of US Diplomacy Initiative, or, or if you'd like to video, uh, view the video from today's event, please visit state.gov Heroes of US Diplomacy. You also can follow the hashtag Heroes of US Diplomacy on social media. And that brings to a close today's program. Thank you again for joining us. And again, uh, thank you to all of our consular colleagues and especially today's honorees for all of your work. Take care. <laughs>